Good morning and welcome to This Week. America and the world, debating a new chief for the Pentagon. Chuck Hagel is the leader that our troops deserve. This is an in-your-face nomination. Ending the war in Afghanistan. Our troops will have a different mission. And starting one with Iran. That conversation with Senators Jack Reed for the Democrats and Republican Bob Corker. Plus ABC's chief global affairs correspondent Martha Raddatz and the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, Richard Haas. Then with the White House set to act on guns. There's got to be some common ground here. We join the search for solutions with the new leaders of No Labels. Plus, the short, strange life of that trillion dollar coin. We should have known a coin was Obama's solution to everything. It was right there in his slogan, change. That and all the week's politics on our Powerhouse Roundtable with Nobel Prize winner Paul Krugman, The Wall Street Journal's Peggy Noonan, America's last Comptroller General David Walker, Judy Woodruff from PBS, and Bloomberg View's Al Hunt. From ABC News, this week with George Stephanopoulos. Reporting from ABC News headquarters, George Stephanopoulos. Hello again, lots to get to this morning, including the Treasury Department's decision late yesterday to bury the idea that a trillion dollar platinum coin could solve the debt limit stalemate. Advocate Paul Krugman and our roundtable ready to weigh in on that. But first, the national security debate with our panel of experts and policymakers, including the senior Republican on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Bob Corker, Democratic Senator Jack Reed, who just returned from his 14th trip to Afghanistan, Council on Foreign Relations President Richard Haas, author of the forthcoming book, Foreign Policy Begins at Home, and ABC's chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raddatz. And Martha, let me begin with you. We saw that announcement from the president on Friday, speeding up the withdrawal of American troops out of Afghanistan. That's a little faster than the military wanted, but he was silent on how many troops would be left behind. What's behind the decision and where do you expect we'll end up? Well, I, I think all through the election season, I thought all they ever talk about is leaving Afghanistan, but this is real. This was a very big deal this week and a very big change. U.S. troops will be in an advise and train that's all they'll be doing come spring. So pulling except back from the front lines. Pulling back from the front lines. They will be with Afghan forces. The president has not announced how fast they'll draw down, but I suspect by the end of this year, we could be down to 30,000 troops. We're 66,000 troops now, possibly down to 30,000. And when we really draw down in 2014, when we are no longer doing combat missions, I think you'll see anywhere from only six to 9,000. And the important thing to remember about that, George, is tooth to tail. Tail means the enablers, the support. We would really have, if we had 3,000 troops there, we would really only have about 800 trigger pull pullers. You're gonna see a lot of counterterrorism action all of those things that Joe Biden talked about a long time ago, I think that's all we'll have there in the future. Senator Cork, are you comfortable with that? Well, I think the decision about the number of troops we have on the ground uh, after 2014 is something that ought to be uh, weighed as we move along. I, I realize we're going to be moving down to about 30,000 troops. I'm, relatively comfortable with that but i think as far as what we the contingent we have after 2014 uh, i would wait and i don't know of any reason why we would make that decision today it seems that we'd want to see what the state of afghanistan is we'd want to see uh, what's happening in the electoral process all of those things are, are obviously big factors my sense is uh, there's no reason to decide whether there's 6,000, 9,000, 15,000 troops until we get to that point. But Senator Reid, how about this decision to pull back to simply training and support by the spring? Last month's Pentagon report said that only one of 23 Afghan battalions is now capable of operating on its own. Well, I was down in R.C. Yeah, East, in Batika know. province, and uh, essentially 87% of the operations in the eastern part are initiated and conducted exclusively by Afghan forces. So you're already seeing a transition, and by next spring, the Afghani forces will be in the lead. Uh, that's what our military has been doing and preparing uh, for the last several months. So I think we're making great progress. There are issues ahead in terms of the election, but ultimately uh, this has to be an Afghan-led effort. President Karzai recognized that. I think the military leaders I met, both American and Afghan for, uh, commanders, recognize it also. And there's something about a deadline to sort of coalesce and to spur action, and action's taking place dramatically in, in Afghanistan today. Richard Haas, the president also addressed our overall success in Afghanistan on Friday. He said it was less than ideal and went on to say this. 
have we been able, I think, to shape uh, a strong relationship with a responsible Afghan government that uh, is willing to cooperate with us to make sure that uh, it is not uh, a launching pad for future attacks against the United States. We have achieved that goal. We are in the process of achieving that goal. Step out just a little bit, said we're in the process of achieving that goal. Is he right about that? And is it sustainable after 2014? The short answer is no. Well, what we started in Afghanistan after 9-11 was a warranted war of necessity. We expanded it over the years, particularly under President Obama in 2009 when we tripled our forces. We decided to go after the Taliban, essentially join Afghanistan's civil war and nation build. The idea that we're going to be able to leave behind a self-sustaining, capable Afghanistan, able to, for a government's able to keep control of its territory, we're not going to be able to do it. It was a mistake to try. We're not going to achieve that result. Essentially, what we're going to fall back to I would think is what we could have fallen back two years ago, a, a limited counterterrorism issue, issue, uh, mission with trainers and advisors on the ground. And when we have to, we'll send in special forces or drones to deal with uh, if there are, for example, remnants of Al Qaeda who ever come back into the country. Let me move on to the man the president wants to run the Pentagon uh, through this process, Chuck Hagel, former senator. Here was the president announcing that pick earlier this week. I came to admire his courage and his judgment, his willingness to speak his mind, even if it wasn't popular even if it defied the conventional wisdom. And that's exactly the spirit I want on my national security team. Senator Corker, you had some positive things to say about Senator Hagel last month when there was, his name was first floated, said he had good relations on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Do you see anything out there now that should disqualify him from the Pentagon post? Well, I think like a lot of people, the, uh, the hearings are going to have a huge effect on me. I know I talked to uh, Chuck this week. He's coming in to see me uh, next week. But I think the hearings, uh, this is going to be a real hearing process, unlike uh, many of the people who end up uh, being confirmed or not confirmed. You know, I have a lot of questions about uh, just his whole uh, nuclear posture views. Um, those are things that haven't really been discussed yet. Obviously, people have concerns about his stance towards Iran and Israel. But I think another thing, George, that's going to come up is just his overall temperament. Uh, and is he suited uh, to run a department uh, or a big agency or a big entity like the Pentagon? And so, uh, look, I, I look about forward to sitting down. I, What's that? You have questions about his temperament? I, I, think there are, I, think, I think there are numbers of staffers uh, who are coming forth now just talking about uh, the way he has dealt with them. I'm, I have certainly questions about a lot of things. I began all of these confirmation processes with an open mind. I did have a good relationship with him. I had a good uh, conversation with him this week. But I think this is, uh, this is one where people are going to be listening to what he has to say, me in particular, about the things I just mentioned, but, but especially some of the positions he's taken, uh, generally speaking, about our nuclear posture. I think you know that I, I've, I affirmed the, the New START Treaty. A lot of modernization was supposed to take place as a result of that on our nuclear arsenal. That is not happening at the pace that it should. The Pentagon's going to have a big effect on that, and for me, that is going to be a very big That's issue. Good. Senator Reid, I had not heard those questions about Senator Hagel's temperament uh, before. I, I wonder if you have heard anything like that, have any concerns like that. I did note this week that your Democratic colleague, Senator Chuck Schumer, said he's not yet convinced that Senator Hagel will be confirmed. Uh, do you agree with that? Well, I believe he'll be confirmed. I think Bob is right. This confirmation process will be a thorough uh, evaluation of of Chuck's positions, and Chuck's very capable of explaining those positions. I think he brings some unique quality to this job. Uh, he is uh, someone who's been involved in uh, issues of national security as a United States Senator. He's someone who has uh, been involved as a leader of the Atlantic Council. Uh, but uh, I think one thing that's terribly compelling, and it goes uh, to his uh, credibility with the forces, uh, he's been a combat soldier. He's fought. He has uh, literally walked in their boots. That, I think, will inspire great confidence uh, in the, the military officers and enlisted men that he deals with, and women. Martha. So uh, I think this situation where he's going to have to answer questions, he's prepared to do it, and I think he'll come out of this with uh, strong support. Martha, the president emphasized that Senator Hagel also be the first enlisted soldier up at the head of the Pentagon. You talk to the military every day, have embedded with the troops. How much, how much of a difference do you think that will make 
that he served as an enlisted soldier. You know, I was in touch with a lot of soldiers and Marines last night via Facebook and email and asked him that very question. And they all said it's, it's great that he has combat service, but that's not what we're looking at. And this is, this is a military that has so much combat experience and really far more than Chuck Hagel. So I think they appreciate it, but it doesn't make an enormous difference. The one thing I think is really important here is the next two years, we are gonna be bringing a lot of veterans home. That matters. Chuck Hagel understands that. He understands what it's like to be wounded, and he would probably pay very close attention to those veterans. Richard Haas, the questions are coming at Senator Hagel from so many different directions. Questions about his views on gay rights, his views on Israel, his views on Iran. We just heard <coughs> Senator Corker talk about questions coming from staff on his temperament. You've served in administrations. You're head of the Council on Foreign Relations. What should be relevant here? The only thing that should be relevant, George, I would say, is his ability to run the Pentagon and his views on policy. And I think there's a space, and there should be a space for the hearings and more broadly, to ask Chuck Hagel, what, does, what is he prepared to do about Iran? What does he think the right mix, say, is of sanctions or the possible use of military force? What should we be doing uh, you know, about cutting the Pentagon budget or Senator Corker said about nuclear issues? All totally legitimate. Where I think people are going over the line is with ad hominem attacks, questioning, for example, whether he's an anti-Semite. I've known Chuck Hagel for more than 20 years for what it's worth, I think that's preposterous. I also don't think that has a place in the public space. We often ask, why aren't public debates better? Why aren't sometimes the best people going into a public life? Well, this is one of the reasons. I think there is a legitimate place here, and the Senate offers it for questioning Senator Hagel or Senator Kerry or anyone else about their policies. I really don't think there's a legitimate place in American political life for ad hominem attacks. These are loaded words that are being cast about, and I think they're simply beyond the pale. Let's move to the question of his views on Iran, because he did address that in his in an interview with his home paper and I want to show what he had said about that this was a, he was responding to the questions that he opposed unilateral sanctions in the past and he went on to say I have not supported unilateral sanctions because when it is us alone they don't work and they just isolate the United States United Nations sanctions are working when we just decrease something that doesn't work. Senator Corker, let me bring that question to you because I was struck by an article in Foreign Affairs magazine this month by Robert Jervis where he pointed out that the U.S. Um, experience with coercive diplomacy and sanctions in places like Panama and Serbia and Afghanistan and Iraq indeed did not succeed. So does Senator Hagel have a point there? Well, there's no question that multilateral sanctions are far more effective. When we began the process with Iran, one of the, one of the amendments that I actually uh, put into that process was to ensure that the sanctions we put in place were much multilateral, and what we didn't do was really uh, hurt those people that who are who are our friends, the very companies and countries that uh, are our allies. So there's no question that uh, when we put sanctions in place, we need to do everything we can to make sure that they are multilateral. One of the reasons that I want to spend time with Chuck Hagel is I think, as Richard Haas has pointed out. There have been a lot of uh, uh, one-liners, if you will, that have been looked at, and I want to I want to dig in and, and find out whether that really is uh, Chuck Hagel's view of the world, or whether we're taking these things out of context. But uh, certainly, I have concerns as we move forward. They're not disqualifying concerns, and again, I think the meetings that I have with him, the hearings that'll take place, are going to be very, very important in his case. Senator Senator Reid, are you confident we can avoid an armed conflict with Iran? this year over their nuclear program, and what's it going to take to prevent that? It's going to take increased pressure economically, and that's why the issue of multilateral sanctions is so critical. Up until we basically enlisted under President Obama, the entire world, or significant parts of it, in putting pressure on the Iranians, uh, they were not at all responsive. We have to continue that pressure. We also have to uh, begin to look very closely at what developing inside Iran. They have elections scheduled for June. That is going to perhaps shape the, the their direction. We hope we'll shape it in a positive way that they will back down from their aspirations for, for nuclear technology and, and nuclear weapons. Uh, but the, the first issue is to keep the pressure on. Uh, as the president said, and, and as Chuck Hagel will say, we need every option on the table. We have to assess all those options. And one of the things interesting enough about this issue of temperament there, I know there's a, a, a close relationship between the president and, and Chuck Hagel. I travel with them. I understand it. But I also understand that Chuck has the wherewithal and the ability to speak truth to power. Uh, he's demonstrated 
yeah. that throughout its entire career. That is a value that is extraordinarily important to the president. I think he recognizes that, and that'll be a, one of the, his virtues as Secretary of Defense. Richard, on this issue of Iran, Senator Reid emphasizes pressure, but one of the points that Robert Jervis makes is that you also have to get a lot more creative on what you're going to, the carrots you're going to offer to Iran so that there might be some way to have a, a, a resolution without a conflict. And that's teed up right now. I think these economic sanctions are having far more impact than any of us imagined. There's a really interesting debate going on right now in, in Iran, George, one that we haven't seen before. The Supreme Leader is allowing a debate to take place about the nuclear policy, about the economy. So this suggests to me the administration can and will go forward with a big negotiation, with a big proposal. And the real question is, can we come up with an approach that's enough for the Iranians and not too much for the United States and the Israelis? Can we, if you will, park the Iranian program at a place that's sufficiently far from nuclear weapon status that we can live with it. I don't know, but we want to find out, because either of the alternatives, going to war against Iran or living with an Iran that has nuclear women's weapons, are extraordinarily unattractive and costly alternatives. So we want to do everything to, we can to see whether we can come up with a solution through negotiation. Martha, we're just about out of time, but as we're talking about Iran's nuclear program, we're also learning that North Korea may be planning another nuclear test. Yeah, there are a lot of signs. I spoke to a U.S. official. There are a lot of signs that North Korea is planning another test. There are trucks in the area. But one of the baffling things is they're doing this very conspicuously. Our satellites can see it. They are aware of when our satellites are around. So they're a little baffled by this and think it must be just some sort of negotiating tactic of some sort. One more. Okay, Martha Raddis, gentlemen, thank you all for your time this morning.